Gracious Father, you are truly incredible, so great, so beautiful. We adore you. We exalt you this evening. And Father, I pray for special grace right now that, that you would use me to communicate effectively on your behalf. Father, take hold of my mind, my heart, my tongue. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight I want to I wanna tell you about the absolute worst summer of my life, which, strangely enough, turned out to be the best summer of my life. I was 14 years old, and Los Angeles, California is all I knew. I had always lived there. I knew those beaches. I knew those streets. All my friends were there. And my mother, just out of nowhere, without asking my permission, announced that we were moving. She said, we're leaving Los Angeles, Ty, and we're never coming back. I said, well, you're leaving Los Angeles. I'm 14. <laughs> and I'm not going anywhere. Everybody I know is here. I'm staying in LA. She said, you have three days to see if any of your friends' parents are fine with you moving in with them. Three days. In three days, we were in a U-Haul, <laughs> headed north. Eight hours north to Sacramento, California. I knew it was there. I had never been there. I had heard of it. There was no ocean nearby, and I knew not a solitary person. We arrived in the summer, and I began to skate around the neighborhood seeing the teenagers in the parks, in their front yards. Have you noticed that teenagers are intimidating? <laughs> they are the most intimidating people in the world. And I couldn't get into a conversation with any of them, but all of them were staring because I was the new kid in town, the new kid on the block. Finally, one guy, his name was Kyle, saw that I was a skater and he began, without any words, guys are like that, just began skating next to me. Next thing you know, we had a friendship, summer was ending, and he said, we're having an end of the summer party before the new school year begins and you're invited. I said, is it your house? No, it's at somebody else's house. How do you know I'm invited? You're invited. Everybody's gonna be there. I'm thinking, who's everybody? I'm nervous. We went to the house. It was swarming with intimidating teenagers. I quickly found my position on the sofa in the living room, just sat down. I'm a people watcher. And that was a strategic position from which to watch all the action. Kyle sat next to me and we watched as the front door opened and closed over and over and over again. People coming, people leaving, one after another. An hour passed by. It was getting boring. Kyle said, why don't you get up? Why don't you meet somebody? I said, I don't want to. Sat there watching the door open and close, open and close. And just when my boredom was about all I could take, and I was about to leave. The door opened one more time, and the most beautiful creature I had ever seen in my life <laughs> walked through the door. I leaned over to Kyle, and I said, do you know her? And he said, dude, everybody knows her. <laughs> She's out of your league. I said, well, that is obviously the case, but I'm feeling a strange motivation rising up within, and I said, are you willing to introduce us? 
He said, it's your pain, dude. <laughs> Come on. And I began to shake inside. But something was driving me. I just had to meet this girl. As we were crossing the room and she's laughing and talking with her friends, I said, Kyle, what is she? <laughs> he said, she's a human. <laughs> I said, no, what is that, that very unique DNA mix there? He said, well, man, her dad's a tall white guy and her mom's a short Mexican lady. Whatever that is. <laughs> I said, that is the perfect DNA mix. And I have been looking for that all my life. <laughs> we crossed the room and I found myself in her immediate presence. He said, this is Ty. And he walked off. I don't think our eyes even met as she just glanced right past me to continue talking with her friends. So I made myself omnipresent. And this is before my conversion, so I knew nothing about omnipresence. <laughs> I anticipated her every move in the house. And I analyzed the trajectory. And I knew where she would be, and I made sure I was there first. Hey, remember we met earlier, I'm Ty. Um, no, actually I don't. And she's on her way with her friends. Well, as Providence would have it, the new school year began and we were in the same math class. <laughs> so I waited to pick my seat until she picked hers. And then you know which one I picked. And then the teacher just announced that she was going to get an automatic A. He knew her, and she would be the tutor that would roam the room for those who needed tutoring with math. I put my hand up. <laughs> and I said, I need help with math. I don't remember any of it. And so... Our relationship began with her teaching me math. Finally, she began coming to my house after school. She met my mom. Forget the math. <laughs> mom, girl, girl, mom. I'm thinking, this is it. My mom likes her. And my mom adored her. And they became friends. And the next thing you know, we were best friends and spending all of our time together. Next thing you know, we're married and procreating. <laughs> Next thing you know... <laughs> Next thing you know, we've been hanging out together for our entire adult life. So there, Kyle. <laughs> So here's the question this evening, and there is theology in the making here. Here's the question tonight. What precisely is it that is going on in us as human beings that makes us the kinds of creatures who look for love to be reciprocated? Do you hear what I'm asking? We know it has to go both ways. And we know that love is not the kind of thing that can happen as a one-sided equation. Don't we? I was experiencing the power of attraction. As I got to know her, suddenly I got to know a personality, a character, a person with thoughts and feelings. And it's just blown my mind over the years. It's incredible. We've been together since she was 13 and I was 14. And just the last time I saw her, we're driving on a pretty long journey. 
And she says things that I never knew were going on inside of her before. And I say, wow, so that's who you are. And I'm just blown away with the fact that a human being is so, so incredibly deep. You can literally get to know somebody forever and discover new stuff. Like the philosopher said, you never step in the same river twice. It's moving, and so it's different water. You're moving, so you're different every time you take a step. Human beings are constantly in motion. We're being formed incrementally, moment by moment, with every experience. We as human beings are in motion. We are, to use the biblical word, we are always in the process of becoming. That's what we are. And so you can always know somebody in new ways. And the infinity of God's character is a deep ocean. And I've discovered something there that is absolutely breathtaking. Well, a number of things, but the thing I want you to just ponder with me tonight is that at the core of the divine character, there is something I'm going to call non-coercive love. I could just call it love, but I want to modify it tonight, and I want to describe this love, I want to allow Scripture to describe this love in such a way that we understand that God's love is decidedly anti-coercion. That God is all about voluntary reciprocation. That he's the one who made us the way we are, and so he's relating to us for our salvation according to the way we are. God is operating on the principle of attraction. He's trying to get our attention because as he gets our attention, as free moral agents, we have the potential to cross the barrier of space between us and him voluntarily. And then when you cross that space voluntarily, you want to be there, and the experience and the relationship is flooded with desire rather than obligation. Now, the Bible is full of this kind of insight regarding the character of God. And the Bible stands alone in the revelation of Jesus Christ as the apex revelation of God's character. The Bible stands alone in this kind of view of who God is. There is no philosophy, there is no other religion in the world that contemplates God as possessing all power, the most powerful person in the universe, and yet opting for love as the relational bridge between him and us as human beings. Consider, for example, a passage of scripture that is absolutely staggering when you begin to wrap your mind around it. This is the book of Hosea, chapter 3 and verse 1. Hosea was a unique prophet. He had the worst possible mission that a prophet could be given. All the other prophets got visions and dreams, and then they just wrote them down. God said, Hosea, I want to make you a living, personified, experiential prophecy. I want you to live something out for me. I want you to be something. I want you to experience something. I'm not going to give you a prophecy. I'm going to make you a prophecy. Hosea, here's what I want you to do. Here's the mission. The Lord said to me, Hosea is testifying, go and go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Notice the next two words, just like. Okay, so God is saying something here. He's saying that this is just like something else. This is like... There's a comparison being made. Hosea, go and love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. And Hosea, this will be just like 
the love of the Lord for the children of Israel. Just put for the human race in there, if you will. God is saying, Hosea, here's your mission. I want you to fall in love with her. She's the one. There's something going on in her heart. She's adulterous. And I want you to fall in love with her, Hosea. And when you feel what it feels like to love somebody with every fiber of your being, Hosea, only to not be loved back, tell my people that's what it's like to be God. This is an Old Testament description of what we call the sin problem. We are partial to definitions of sin that are legal and technical. And there are biblical examples of that. Sin is transgression of the law. Yes, it is. But we fail to mention, we fail to realize in that single stroke of revelation, sin is transgression of the law, we fail to realize that the law that is spoken of is described in Scripture as the tender inner workings of the divine heart and character. That, that the law is, in fact, a codified explanation, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, a codified revelation of what love looks like in action. We sometimes say love or the law is a transcript of God's what? What do we say? Character. And so it is. So when the Bible says that sin is transgression of the law, it literally means that sin is a violated love relationship. That sin is, in fact, relational breakdown. It's faithfulness, relational integrity coming from one direction and not being returned. That's what sin is. So this Old Testament perspective, this Old Testament description of the sin problem is, is, is very relational, is very personal. God is saying, I'll tell you what it's like to be God in relation to sinners, fallen human beings. Hosea, love that girl. And when you love her, and when you feel what it feels like to not be loved back, Hosea, when you feel the feelings of a jilted lover, tell my people, that's what it feels like to be God. But now here's the fascinating thing. This is the almighty creator of the universe, and he can do anything he jolly well pleases. He's God, we're not. If you wanted to, he could just pull rank. I'm God, you're not, basic arrangement, you do what I say or else. And all of us would comply with all of his requirements behaviorally. But the question would continue to hang in the universe, does anybody love God? Even while apparent obedience is taking place. And so, here, God tells us, skipping back to chapter 2, this is God's method for remedying the sin problem. God says, in relation to this lover relationship that is broken, therefore, behold, and this is interesting, God says, I will allure her. Now, her, that's Israel in the local historical sense. That's the human race in the broader sense. God says, here's how I'm going to save them, Hosea. I'm going to allure them to me. He goes on and he says, I'm going to bring her into a secluded place and speak words of love to her. That's how I'm going to pull off their salvation. I'm not going to manipulate. I'm not going to coerce. I'm not going to pull rank. I'm going to save their adulterous hearts by alluring them back to me. I'm going to put before them something extremely attractive. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all to me. Jesus is is the point of God's attraction. Jesus is the one who is revealing 
to human minds and hearts that God literally loves you and me more than his own existence to draw us back to him. I will allure her to me. Now, Hosea goes on, the prophecy of Hosea, this particular rendering of the plan of salvation. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to operate on the principle of attraction. I'm going to allure. I'm going to get her alone. I'm going to speak words of love to her. And then God says, something's going to happen. And I'm praying right now on another track of my mind that this will register so deeply. Please hear this. In the day when God allures, it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband. And you will, get this, you will no longer call me my master. This is tremendously insightful because this is God putting two kinds of relational dynamics side by side, and he's saying there's this master-slave kind of dynamic, master-servant kind of thing that you all as human beings are familiar with, and then there's this matrimonial thing that you're familiar with. There's the husband-wife relationship, and there's the servant-master relationship. And that brings to our minds two different ways of relating and being related to. And God literally says here, he says, listen, I'm going to save you by alluring you. And when that alluring love captures your mind, you're going to undergo a massive paradigm shift. The most fundamental crucial of all paradigm shifts. You will cease relating to me in terms of my power over you. You will cease relating to me as a master and you will begin relating to me as a husband. He's literally saying, I'm going to pull off the most remarkable thing imaginable. I'm going to lead you to fall in love with me. Now, the master-servant relationship has certain characteristics. The primary motive that's driving that relational dynamic is fear. You do what I say or else. Why? I'm in charge. I'm bigger than you are. I'm the one who has the power. In the book Desire of Ages, page 480, we read these words. It is not the fear of punishment, nor the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. But they behold his matchless love in Christ at Calvary, and the sight of him attracts. End of quote. The slave master thing, that has to do with fear. But the gospel informs us that, that, that God's love, perfect love, what does it do with fear? It casts it out. God's love displaces fear as the motive that governs the relationship. And so we move to a different kind of relating, a different kind of connection with God. And, and you can almost hear excitement in God's voice here. He's anticipating this. He's thinking to himself, I just can't wait until they stop seeing me that way. I can't wait until they grow up in their spirituality to the point where they see me as a loving, good husband. And they begin to love me back. Astounding that the throne of the universe is occupied by this kind of God. And then God literally drops to his knee and proposes in verse 19. I will betroth you to me forever. 
Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in loving kindness and mercy. He's saying, I'm going to be to you like this. I'm going to relate to you with righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I'm going to be consistently faithful in my relationship with you. And I will betroth you to me on the premise of that kind of relating. And then verse 20, amazing. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And notice, you shall know the Lord. The Hebrew word here is yada. Y-A-D-A. It's the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Listen, where the scripture says, Adam knew yada his wife Eve, and she conceived and brought forth a son. It's not talking about mere intellectual knowing. It's talking about the knowing of intimacy. When it says Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and brought forth a son, it doesn't mean Adam contemplated her. Women don't get pregnant by being contemplated. This isn't science. It's not the kind of knowledge that we think of when we think of biology or sociology or mathematics. It's the kind of knowing that happens when relational intimacy at the deepest level occurs and new life emerges. And so God is saying on bended knee, I love you. And I know you have distorted perceptions of me. You think what I want is outward compliance and you can't pull it off. Actually what I want is your heart. And the outward obedience part that comes with the inward part. God is a relational genius, and that's an understatement. He knows exactly what he's doing. He has super high EQ, and he is relating to us on the premise of how he made us. Now, this is fascinating to me. The ancient Hebrew people regarded one book of the Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible. The ancient Hebrews regarded one book of the Bible to be the most holy place of Scripture, the mountaintop of God's self-revelation, the most holy place of Scripture. Now, if you were to venture a guess as to what the most holy place of Scripture might be, maybe you'd get it right, maybe you wouldn't, I don't know. I'm listening. Exodus, Leviticus, nope. (laughs) Maybe it's Genesis is the most holy place of Scripture. What about Exodus with the Ten Commandments? Come on. Song of Solomon, thank you. The Song of Solomon, really? That's the book that the scholars, back whenever they were arguing about it, deciding whether or not deciding what books would make up the canon of Scripture, that's the book the scholars were arguing about and saying, I don't think that should be in there. Solomon went over the top with that. Solomon, that is a love song to his girlfriend for crying out loud. That can't be in the Bible. And somehow, by the grace of God, it won out and we have 66 books. The Song of Solomon is remarkable for what it reveals of the character of God. And I'll tell you how it won out and why it's in the Bible. And that's because the Bible, in many other places, has this matrimonial kind of language, this this language of romance, this language of lover and beloved. If you open to the Song of Solomon, and you don't have to do that tonight, just listen, allow yourself to take in some of Solomon's incredible poetry as he gushes and pours himself out to his girl. This is Solomon to the Shulamites. He says in chapter 1, 
And verse 9, my love, you remind me of my horse. <laughs> Literally, he said that. <laughs> Chapter 4 and verse 2, well, the latter part of verse 1, he says, your hair is like a flock of goats. He thought that was good. <laughs> Verse 2, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just washed. <laughs> she was no doubt a flosser. And then, <laughs> look at this, look at this. In chapter 7, verse 2, your belly button, yes, He's going to talk about her belly button. Your belly button is like a goblet. Have you seen those goblets they used to have? Did she have an Audi or an Innie? I think, I think this is a pretty big belly button. I don't know. Okay, and then he says, check this, I'm sorry. Then he says in verse 2, the latter part of verse 2, he says, and your waist, your waist? He's talking about the girl's waistline. Your waist, he says, is like a heap of wheat framed by lilies. This is Solomon at his best. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, and then he says in verse 5 of chapter 7, your head is like Mount Carmel. Okay, so forget all of that. We have different ways of romancing, thankfully. <laughs> Today, language maybe has evolved, or maybe this is as good as it gets. I don't know. But here's what's going on in the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs. Here's what's going on. One of the reasons why it was argued that the book should be removed that it shouldn't be included is because some said God's not even mentioned in the book. It's just Solomon gushing about his girl. God's not in the book. But here's the thing. God is in the book. One time at the pinnacle of this beautiful expression of romantic love. Solomon and the Shulamite are going back and forth in the song. Back and forth, I love you, and here's how I see you. Well, I love you too. And she's gushing to her girlfriends in the song. It's just beautiful, back and forth, back and forth. This is how I love you, well, this is how I love you. And then, in chapter eight, stunning, Shulamite says to Solomon, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. I, 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 want, I want you to captivate my mind and my actions. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death. And jealousy is as tenacious as the grave. Its flames, the flames of love, are flames of fire. And this version says, a most vehement flame. And the word vehement there is Yah, Yahweh, the name of God. He literally says, she literally says, Solomon, your love is as strong as death. You would rather die than live without me. Your love for me is as tenacious as the grave. It has so captured my heart that I can't even imagine living without you. It's so powerful, it's like fire, she says. Solomon, your love is a flame of fire. Fire, the very fire of Yahweh himself. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. It's messianic. 
is pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to that point in history, in real time, when God in Christ will reveal that his love for you and me is stronger than death. That God literally loves you and me more than his own existence. Calvary proves that God would rather die forever than to live without you, to live without me. This love is so powerful that it captivates the human heart on the deepest possible level. I will allure you to me, he says. And when I do, you'll get a whole different picture of who I am. Your heart is dark with misapprehension of who I am. You think I want things that I don't actually want. You assume that the relationship is on the premise of my demands to please me. But actually what I want for you is a quality of life that is mutually pleasing for both of us. Song of Solomon is a brilliant poem in one more respect that I'll bring to your attention. Solomon is the man, and Solomon is the male name for shalom, peace. Shulamite just happens to be the female version of shalom in a woman's name, like Michael and Michaela, or Daniel and Daniela, or Max and Maxine. Solomon and Shulamite. And after those words are spoken, your love is like the fire of God, Solomon. It has so deeply gripped me. She comes to this point of resolve. She says, then, that is in the light of his love for me, then, she says, I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Shalom is the word. It's the word not just for serenity, like being alone in a room and not hearing any noises. That's not what shalom means. Shalom isn't serenity. Shalom is the biblical word that describes a relationship in which Individuals coexist without harm, where everything touches everything else without violation, where everybody's interacting in a world where everybody puts everybody else first. And so everybody has the security of being perfectly loved by all the others. That's what the world looks like in its final form. And that's what the plan of salvation seeks to achieve for you and me and in you and me, that Solomon and Shulamite together in relational harmony are finally at peace with one another. The peace that comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ in giving his love his life, everything that he was for you and me at Calvary. Interestingly enough, when we come to the New Testament, having explored the Song of Solomon and Hosea, this is fascinating. Jesus follows up this concept of the divine human romance and the knowing that is to occur. In John 17, verse 3, he describes the plan of salvation in decidedly relational terms. He's speaking to the Father in prayer and describing the ultimate objective that he came to the world to achieve for us as human beings. And notice the language he chooses to employ. Jesus, speaking to the Father, says, this is eternal life. This is the thing, Father, that we're trying to give them. 
This is eternal life, that they may, what's the word there? Know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus is deliberately lifting the Old Testament word, the Old Testament concept for matrimonial intimacy. He's lifting it from the Old Testament, pulling it into the New Testament, and giving it salvational significance. He doesn't define eternal life, salvation, in terms of its duration, as, as we commonly define eternal life. If somebody said to you, what is the gift of eternal life? What is eternal life? What would the answer be? Kind of, duh, it's forever. Eternal life. It's living forever without end. It's minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years. It just goes on and on and on. But Jesus didn't define eternal life in terms of its quantity of days. He defined eternal life and therefore defined salvation in terms of the quality of life that's involved. He said, I'll tell you what eternal life is. Eternal life is a kind of life, it's a quality of life that is defined by intimacy with God, by knowing God. That's what eternal life is. And in that sense, the New Testament bears out over and over again that eternal life is not something you get at the end of this journey, at the second coming or the resurrection. You don't get eternal life in the future. You get it and have it now. This is why Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I have come that you may have, present tense, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. It's a quality statement. In 1 John chapter 5, John says, the whole reason I've written all of this to you, everything that he's written, the whole reason I've said all of this to you, John says, is that you may know that you have eternal life. Eternal life is something you have right now because it's a quality of life that experientially is present with us. I'm experiencing it right now. I have eternal life. It's coursing through my body, my emotions, my mind in the form of reciprocal love with God and his children. I have it now. This is why Paul said things like, my, my body, my physical body, my biology is wasting away day by day while I'm being renewed in my spirit simultaneously. It's like when you come to Jesus, biologically you're getting older, 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 and you come to Jesus, and biologically you continue to get older, and spiritually and psychologically and emotionally, you begin to get younger and younger and younger. You become innocent again. You start to love pure and lovely things. You start to laugh your head off at stuff that is truly funny. And your heart gets healed of all the damage and the wounds so that you begin to feel like something is going on inside of you that is a new kind of energy. It's youth. You're getting younger. Younger and younger and younger and younger into eternity future. And then at the second coming, the finishing touch of immortality. Resurrected or standing alive to meet Jesus at his coming. And then we don't get eternal life, we just continue on with it. We just keep on living within that knowingness, that yada, that in intimacy with God. We stand in his presence 
And 1 John chapter 3 and 4 says, we stand in his presence with boldness, if you can believe that. We're actually perfectly at home in God's presence because all we sense in him is perfect acceptance and affirmation. And he's been courting our affections all along through this plan of salvation. He's been drawing and alluring and drawing and alluring. And, and then finally we come to this place where we say, then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. The relationship is in harmony. We're in sync with the divine heart. This is life eternal, Jesus says. It's to know God. And then, if there's any mistaking that he meant what we're suggesting he means, when you come to the end of the prayer, he loops back and he uses another word in place of no. Oh, righteous Father, he says, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and watch this, this is so amazing, and I have declared to them your name, Father. The whole point of my mission was to disclose the beauty of your character so that they could know you. The diagnosis of the lost condition is, in the previous verse, they don't know you. That's what it means to be lost. But Jesus says, I know you, and so I've, I've declared to them your name, and here's the whole point. And I will declare it that, so that, in order that, the love with which you have loved me, Father, may be in them and I in them. What? This is, this is what the plan of salvation is all about? You and me being, being incorporated into, relationally pulled into the very love that exists between the Father and the Son? In the previous verses, Jesus says, I read this earlier today, Jesus said, you remember? Jesus says, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. You remember that in verse 24? Father, you loved me before the world was created. But then Jesus says, in the same passage, he says, Father, you love them as you love me. I would be perfectly content for God just to spare my miserable hide put me on the moon with an oxygen tank and throw manna down every third day to keep me alive, and that would be grace. We deserve complete annihilation, extinction from existence. We don't deserve another breath of air. And yet God, in his lavish love, isn't saying, I'm just going to spare you. He's saying, I actually like you. I want to spend eternity with you. I want you to come in to this beautiful relational Trinitarian love that has been going on for all eternity past between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want you to come in to the inner circle. I want you to be here with us experiencing what we experience. Father, let's bring them in. Let's save them out of sin. Yes, we've got that part down. Let's save them out of sin. But there's not just a vacancy, is there? Let's save them out of sin into our love. Let's flood them with our love, Father, so they can experience what we experience. Wow. I so love this God. I can't imagine not knowing this. And I can never unknow it. I hope you never unknow this. 
Bottom line, voluntary love, voluntary love is the truest and highest exercise of our humanity, and that is literally all God wants for us. Everything else comes in its train. As I see it, it's something like this. You and I, we're seated on a sofa, and the door is opening and closing and opening and closing, and everything this world has to offer is parading by. And then one more time, the door has opened, and the most beautiful person in the universe has just stepped into the room. And there's just one question. Is God attractive? Is he beautiful in our eyes? Do we see in him everything that is glorious and worthy so that we will voluntarily choose, not because we have to, but because we want to, that we would voluntarily choose to love him back? That's the question.